can investigative journalism survive? It's a question that journalists are always asking again and again and again and again. Uh, and you see clearly of interest to see the number of you here tonight. Uh, and we're always in some kind of existential crisis that it's always about to collapse and yet somehow it just keeps on going and more and more stories are published that powerful people don't want to be published, which is probably the best definition of investigative uh, journalism. When I inherited the Sunday Times Insight team in 1983, uh, which was then probably the best known investigative journalism in the world, uh, I abandoned the team and the answer then was investigative journalism couldn't survive. Somehow the new team went on to discover that Arthur Scargill was trying to raise money from Colonel Gaddafi during the miners strike. Uh, it discovered the secret people who were donating money to the Conservative Party, two of whom were on the run from the law, and it uh, revealed all the secrets of uh, Israel's nuclear arsenal. So somehow the investigative journalism survived. We have five speakers tonight who are at the heart of investigative journalism, who themselves have done some wonderful work. So please, let me begin with one of the country's best known authors and journalists, famous for his investigative journalism. If he says he's going to write a book about you, my advice is to leave the country right away. Tom Barr. Good evening. Uh, we've each got five minutes, so I shall rattle through it. Uh, all journalism is investigative, good journalism, but there are three reasons why it is at the moment imperiled. One of them is a lack of money and the proprietors of papers like the Daily Express and the Sadly the Mirror and others who are not interested in supporting investigative journalism. The second reason is unfortunately the libel laws and the once in a lifetime reason, uh, uh, once in a lifetime possibility of reforming the laws to make it possible like in America to have adequate defences has been lost because the parliamentarians were not interested in embracing the fundamental problems of British libel laws, which are the costs and the procedures. And unfortunately, journalists did not unite to combat uh, parliamentarians and got diverted on a trivial issue of libel tourism when the fundamental issue is how do you defend yourself cheaply and how do you turn the law to protect the person who believes he's telling the truth, as you can in America. So the libel laws are still, and will remain throughout our lifetimes, a major handicap to good investigative journalism and true investigative journalism. The third reason is the Leveson inquiry and everything that's gone around that, and that casts a ghastly cloud and over everything we now do. And the reason I say that is this, that we're in a position now where a policeman can knock over Ian Tomlinson, a, policeman can, a group of policemen can shoot Jimenez in Stockwell, a group of policemen can falsify statements in Hillsborough and even set up a cabinet minister, and not one policeman is ever convicted of the crimes which they convict, commit. And yet, dozens and dozens of journalists employed by News International are now either charged or have been arrested and are living in limbo for what, in comparison to what the police have done, and we are not professionals as journalists, we're just tradesmen, are trivial offences in my view. And this is where we get to the heart of why we're even, I think, having this debate now, which we wouldn't have had probably three years ago. And that is this. Undoubtedly in the last couple of years, one of the finest pieces of investigative journalism was done by The Guardian in exposing hacking. It was a conspiracy to suppress a crime and it would have succeeded if The Guardian hadn't exposed it. But I think now it's gone too far. And although I'm, I'm looking forward to hear what Alan has to say about it, I think that The Guardian needs to now stop this battle which it started between itself and the right-wing press. Hmm, I wonder who we should go to next. How about the editor of The Guardian, Alan Rusbridger? Um, if we, I mean, I think it would be boring for all if we spent the whole evening talking about Leveson, because I think there are bigger things to worry about. Um, but if we want to talk about Leveson, that's fine. Um, but I mean, just four quick points. The Guardian didn't close the news of the world. Rupert Murdoch did. Um, if, whether it was a clever decision of him, I, d I don't know. If you want to know what, what happened with Millie Dowler and Gordon Brown, go and read the Leveson report. I don't know if Tom has. Uh, but the, but he, he goes into those things in great detail. Uh, anybody who seriously... Uh, how many people have met David Bell in this audience? I mean, he, he is one of the most inoffensive um, 
uh, mild-mannered, um, I hope you wouldn't mind me calling him a do-gooder, uh, he's, he's uh, anyone who thinks that David Bell uh, is the biggest threat or was the biggest threat to press freedom in this country um, is, uh, I fear, just detached from reality. Uh, uh, and similarly, if, if you really think the Guardian's uh, failure so far to join Ipso is the worst thing that we're all facing, uh, again, this debate is, 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 is going to sort of float off into, into uh, another planet. Um, anyway, what are, the, what are the real issues? On, on some of them, I, I agree with, with uh, Tom. Uh, and, and I want to say, first of all, at the back of the audience there is Brian MacArthur, and each year for the last eight years, he and I have sat on uh, the, uh, the, the award in memory of Paul Foote, a great uh, investigative reporter, uh, and the quality of uh, submissions that comes in every year from the national press, from the regional press, uh, from the trade press, from the new press, the, 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 uh, the bloggers here, is really outstanding and, and gives you hope. And, and you know, so let's not, let's not all beat ourselves up and get into a spiral of despair tonight. Um, I agree with Tom about some of the reasons. Obviously, money is one of them. Uh, the law is another. Uh, the Guardian's got no money. Uh, that that is well known. Um, and yet, in the past five years, we've done British Aerospace, we've done Traffic Euro, we've done a huge amount on tax avoidance. Uh, we've done Ian Cobain's work on torture and rendition. We've done the death of Ian Tomlinson. We've done uh, Liam Fox. Uh, uh, we've, we've done phone hacking. We've done undercover cops. We've done WikiLeaks. And we've now done the NSA and Snowden. That's not a bad track record uh, for, 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 uh, for, for, for journalism and, and for investigative journalism. Uh, and I would argue that, that if you're going to use money as an excuse, you're leading yourself into editorial failure and you're leading yourself into commercial failure because what those investigations show, they can't be justified, obviously, uh, in, in terms of the, the money each one costs, but they do say something about who you are, what you believe in, uh, and what your, what your values are. Uh, and The Guardian's ended up the third biggest English language paper in the world uh, as a result of, of that work. Uh, and that's people, I think, partly because people recognize that we are doing what we all went into journalism uh, to do. Our first speaker tonight is an investigative journalist, uh, without whom we would never have found out all these delicious details of MPs' expenses, from the, the moat to the duck house, and many things in between. Our third speaker is Heather Brook. Hi, well, I'm a, a practicing investigative journalist and now a professor of journalism at City University. And I say that because um, I've, moved, I've kind of moved uh, laterally across industries. It seems every industry I go into has a major disruption. So first journalism, then uh, writing books, publishing, and academia. But there's a reason why I've kind of traversed those three different uh, careers. And really, it is, it is a disruption. It's incredibly uh, difficult to um, investigate news that's in the public interest and not in the private interest. And when I think about that question, can investigative journalism survive, I have to say, no, I don't think it will in the current form that we think of it. And in the current form, I think of it as doing a kind of civic good, the whole fourth estate uh, idea, where you as a journalist are out there as a sort of uh, a different type of regulator. You're the public's hired gun and you're out there um, speaking for the public, investigating on the public's behalf. The problem now is that the public aren't paying for that. And I was interested to hear the results of the YouGov survey saying that people in general support investigative journalism. The problem is that support doesn't translate into financial support. And this is the issue with the idea, this kind of illusion that people have that the news is free and that they can continue to not have to pay for news and they'll still get good quality uh, investigations that are done in the public interest. Well, that's just not the case. It's not sustainable to do that. It takes a lot of resources to do that sort of civic investigation. And if the main audience that you're doing it for doesn't think that it's valuable enough to pay for it, then why are you going to continue? And so that's really kind of why I've, I, I sort of morphed out of newspapers into writing books, because there was more of a, I thought, a sort of financial stability around writing books. And now into academia, where there's still uh, 
an environment where you can do that sort of long-form research and verification and get paid for it. Our uh, fourth panelist tonight is the man who gave us the sexed up dossiers of the Iraq war, which led to a huge crisis for the Blair government and for the BBC. And it's interesting that the fallout from that crisis was that the broadcasting organization which had revealed the sex up dossiers lost its top people, whereas the government that had produced the sex up dossiers didn't lose anybody. Andrew Gilligan. In my career as a journalist, I have lied, I have grossly invaded people's privacy, I have received stolen goods, and for those things I have won two of the top awards in the profession. <laughs> In uh, 2003, I got the Amnesty International Award for lying to the sales director of a company that was marketing illegal anti-personnel landmines. Uh, if I'd said who I really was, of course, he wouldn't have sold me any. Um, so, with the help of a slightly dodgy freelance investigator, I concocted a fake identity. In 2008, I won Journalist of the Year at the British Press Awards for an investigation into a man called Lee Jasper. Uh, senior aide to the then Mayor of London, Ken Livingston. Jasper resigned and, and Livingston's re-election campaign was harmed after I published emails in which Jasper proposed to quote Honey Glaze, a woman whose project he had granted £100,000 of public money to. Now I didn't steal those emails nor did I ask anyone else to. Uh, but after the story was over, Livingston's biographer reported that they were obtained by someone in City Hall who had accessed Jasper's computer using a password on a post-it note that he had left by his terminal. You could, I suppose, say that they were hacked. Now, everybody accepted, I think, that those stories were in the public interest, um, but it's a demonstration that uh, investigative journalism cannot always be genteel, cannot always be respectable, um, and, and sometimes has to use methods and sometimes has to produce outcomes. Um, in view of some, some people that are questionable. You may remember a, a story a few months ago about the kind of ludicrous expenses of the Cumbria Police and Crime Commissioner who spent £700 on attending two meetings of chauffeur driven car, produced by source material of a very similar sort to the, the, the kind I used, undeniably a public interest story. The person who was uh, allegedly responsible for the leak has been arrested. Her home was searched only today. In fact, it's been announced that she's facing no charges. I, I think the usual worry about the future of investigative journalism, uh, the economics of it, is a bit overplayed. Um, and that is for two reasons. Firstly, in a shrinking market, uh, newspapers have realised that original stories can make us stand out. The Telegraph and The Times used to do little or no investigative journalism. Uh, both of us now do a great deal. There is actually more investigative journalism in the national press than there was, not less. The second reason it's overplayed is that technological change has made investigative journalism far cheaper to do. Um, I mean, the, the dirty little secret of investigative journalism is that most stories do not come from mysterious individuals handing over brown envelopes in car parks. They come from quite boring places, actually, places that are available for anybody to see if they could be bothered to look, like Hansard and select committee reports. That's where you get the germ of an idea from. Well, the question is, uh, can investigative journalism survive? And I think it can, um, it will always survive because there will always be people on the inside with consciences who feel uh, brave enough to expose wrongdoing. And there will also be, always be nosy people uh, who go into journalism and want to uncover it. Um, but it is getting a lot harder in my opinion. Uh, Heather said we live in a, a closed society I believe. and. Um, Andrew also said that there's been a growth of state action against uh, journalism, and I believe that, that that is true. I don't think that the public realise how difficult it is for journalists to get information out of officialdom. Uh, we are thought to live in a progressive, relatively progressive society, but um, when I've reported from abroad, the, act, the attitude to information that... Um, government agencies abroad have and so on is, is much more open than it is in Britain and that's really difficult for us um, as journalists. Um, in my experience financial pressures have taken a toll. Uh, it is expensive to fund investigative journalism because it doesn't always come off um, and um, you can go down garden paths quite some way before 
it falling apart and if you live in a straightened uh, newsroom that is um, something that the paper would have to support and I'm very grateful that the Independent does that with me. A lot of the major stories that have broken in recent years, including the Guardian's phone hacking story, have come from police sources and it is increasingly difficult in my experience for police officers to talk to journalists in the public in, uh, on matters that are in the public interest. I understand that there were concerns around interactions between journalists and police officers, you know, so I understand that, um, the, the concerns, but, it, you know, they've taken a, uh, the state has taken a sledgehammer to crack a nut and it, it's really, really difficult to interact with sources in my opinion. I thought that it was safe on Skype until I read the Snowden revelations, but um, apparently they've been monitoring that since 2009, so uh, that's... Old-fashioned uh, old fashioned letters. So face-to-face <laughs> yeah. so -face meetings are more vital than ever, um, and that is obviously time-consuming and difficult logistically. There were two recent examples, just in the last week, of, um, of instances where it's just evident that people in power don't really want the public to know what's really going on. Um, Andrew alluded to one of them, the arrest of the source um, who blew the whistle on the newly elected Cumbria Police and Crime Commissioner's expenses. Um, the chap had just been elected and had spent £700 taking two uh, rides in a chauffeur-driven car and the police official leaked it to the local newspaper and was arrested and it was clear, in my opinion, right from the word go, that that action was in the public interest uh, and yet uh, the police official faced six months of uncertainty while the CPS considered whether or not it was in the public interest and, you know, you've got to ask why that was. Um, again, just going back to my point on the uh, officialdom's attitude to information, um, just last week um, a big story broke on Jimmy Savile and um, the transcripts of police interviews <coughs> that Surrey Police conducted with Jimmy Savile in 2009 were released under the FOI Act and um, uh, Surrey Police and its Crime Commissioner said um, it is right to publish these transcripts, it's in the public interest. But actually what had happened is an investigative journalist, Jonathan Cork from the Daily Star, put uh, an FOI request into Surrey Police for those transcripts, which showed the bizarre relationship Jimmy Savile had with the police. He put, um, he put that FOI request in in March and Surrey Police fought it tooth and nail. It is increasingly difficult to operate as an investigative journalist, but um, I do believe it can survive uh, for the reasons I said. Can investigative journalism survive? Let me just have in a sentence from all of you the answer to that question. Tom Barr. Absolutely, yes. Yes. Andrew. Yes, it can. Yes. Heather. In some form. <laughs> Tom. Yes.